You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Hello, everybody. Al Bolowski with another edition of Catholic Mysticism, where we talk about all things of our Catholic faith and topics and the supernatural aspects of our faith, focusing on that and uh, the beautiful miraculous faith that we have that Jesus so blessed us with uh, to just follow him. It's such an awesome thing when you think about it that Jesus throughout time, the beginning of creation, knew when we would be born and would choose us and allow us to offer a gift of himself so that through our free, free will, may be willing to choose and follow him from the beginning of time. How awesome. There's all the millions of people and that we uh, accept that gift and uh, just live for him and his kingdom and, and all the good and joy that that brings. And it's a, an incredible thing. It really is. Um, there's so much uniqueness to the mystical world and so many things that are or mysteries that we can't have the answer to. And, you know, we, really if we think about it, we shouldn't. You know, we, we live certainly in an age that's very narcissistic, very, very enlightened. That's the word that many people use. And, of course, we had an age of enlightenment, an age of reason. And, you know, we feel that uh, we're the catch now. There's never been anybody like us living in this particular society that has gone before us, and we tend to poo-poo many of the things that um, earlier cultures uh, believed in and looked at, and uh, we kind of look down our nose upon them, and not a real good thing to do. You know, we should, uh, in humbleness and humility, uh, be able to learn from them, just as we hope people learn from us, both on the pluses and the negative sides. Uh, Certainly with the mistakes we make, let's hope we... uh, future generations will learn. But uh, one of the weaknesses of human nature is that we don't learn from past generations. And uh, we do repeat a lot of the same phobias that have plagued mankind since the get-go. But anyway, speaking of that, we, we're going to um, turn to part two of our story about a very famous night. Uh, I began it last week. As part of the show, we had a double show with uh, King Charlemagne and then who called Vieux Doni de, Go- de Gosson, a knight that was known as the Dragon Slayer. And I'll just recap quickly. Uh, he was a knight of St. John, or which is more known as the Hospitallers. And there was a great, great beast that they said was a dragon that was killing people in, in the... Uh, animals at the time put in great fear and night after night rode out to try and defeat this beast and never came back. So Dozen was a disgraced knight who decided that the way to redemption was he himself would have to kill this beast. So we'll pick it up from there because you can go to part one and see what he did and how he did it. And obviously, his title is the Dragon Slayer. If you're just tuning into part two, you would be correct in surmising that he did conquer his fear and conquer this great beast, this dragon. So with that being said, we'll pick up on part two of this uh, incredible story and this incredible man, Gozen. And uh, we go. So, Gozen was under the dragon when his squires found him, and they thought he was dead. And they removed his helmet, and they splashed cold water upon his face. And then they laughed with relief, because they witnessed him sputter and look about. And then he sat up. And Gozen saw that he had, did, had indeed slain the dragon. And that, you might think, where we ended last week, 
would have been the end of the story. With the death of this monster, that was it. But such was not the case. Now, goes in after this incredible battle and being wounded, had to, to rest. He was in an awful fight. And after he had rested, he retrieved his horse and his squires cut off the dragon's head. And then they made for the city of Rhodes and interest was piqued as they saw this knight and his squires with this dragon head. And a growing crowd of peasants joined them along the way. And they were joyous and they were celebrating because this creature that had terrorized them for so long where they wouldn't go out of their homes, they celebrated the news that the dragon is dead. And of course, what did they do? They lauded their champion. And they escorted Gozen in triumph to the palace of the Grand Masters of the Knights. Now, as Gozen approached the palace, word, of course, began to filter out. And it caught like wildfire. And it filled the city. And it so happened that at this particular time, the Grand Master was present. And Gozen was brought in and stood in the great hall before the head of his order. And he was an unsightly sight. His armor was gashed, dented. His mantle was torn. He was filthy. And his brother knights that were in the order stood very solemnly around their grand master and strangely despite this great festivity and this uproar in the city of the monster being destroyed they were quiet in the midst of all of this now both the Grand Master, Grand Master Villeneuve Wei, and his knight Gozen seemed oblivious to the crowd that was outside the palace. And they came in. And they, and they, they pushed in and they strained. They wanted to be around uh, the Grand Master Villeneuve and this hero of theirs, this champion of theirs, this knight of theirs, Gozen. And still oblivious to the crowd, Villeneuve ordered him to give an account of his exploits. And as Gozen again, explaining his victory, this marvelous story, his sudden reappearance after a self-imposed exile, a hush silent began fall upon the crowd. Now Grandmaster Villanueve spoke not a word, but from time to time he would nod as he listened to the young knight. And it didn't seem as if he was very impressed. And as soon as Golden uh, had finished his story, However, the people of Rose, they raised their voices boisterously, acclaiming their hero and praising him repeatedly for this incredible, this, this unbelievable accomplishment, something that they've said could not be done, could not be done, impossible. This beast was too great. This challenge was insurmountable. The Grand Master, in his wisdom, waited patiently for the crowd to quiet down, which they finally did. And then he stood up from his chair. And he began to speak. 
and he admitted that valor was an indispensable virtue for a knight. And with deep sincerity, he congratulated Gozen for his victory over the dragon. But he continued. And he said that Gozen, in an act of disobedience against his brotherhood, had set himself squarely against his order. Well, you can imagine if you were part of that crowd and you were cheering Gozen and this dragon had been slain and the terror and the darkness and the cloud had been relieved, you would think that everyone, everyone would be filled with great joy. The terror was over. And yet, Grandmaster Villanueva had thrown a wrench into those works because he reminded Gozen and everyone there of Gozen's disobedience, which caused him to be disgraced in the first place that led to his quest to redeem himself by slaying the dragon. And the startled crowd, well, they were quieted to a shocked silence. They couldn't believe. Did, did he say that? Did he really say that about our hero? And, of course, murmurs began to break out. And they spoke against the old grandmaster, Benalewa. But he remained unmoved. Even if this young knight could have won a claim for the entire world, it would not have made any difference in the Grand Master's eyes. The rule of that order demanded that Grand Master Villanueva should denounce Gozen for his disobedience, and that is what he did. Now, it shouldn't mean that we take this to mean he disliked this wayward knight because the reality was that the Grand Master loved Gozen like a son. And he was very solicitous for his soul. He was very concerned because of that act of of disobedience for Gozen's soul. So it was important in his wisdom for him to determine what was Gozen's true motivation for his actions. And this pained him, but he had to do it. And when the Grand Master turned from the crowd back to face Gozen, his features had hardened into a mask of anger. And he publicly... uh, front of this hero-worshipping crowd accused Gozen of failing in his first duty, that of obedience to the master and of his order, his fellow knights. And he said, in combating the dragon, you inexcusably elevated your own self-will above the dictates of your commander. And he might have been victorious over that creature that had held the people of Rhodes in fear. But at what cost to yourself, Gozen? Had not another dragon taken possession of you? The spirit of sedition and disobedience were signs of the ancient dragon. Just as were vainglory and the seeking of one's self-will. Had Gozen not become puffed up by this public acclaim? Was it not true that perhaps the dragon had conquered his heart in turning him against his master and thus against Christ himself?
Nudani Day goes on, bowed his head, and he made no reply. Though Velenueva, oh, he, he got a reply from the crowd. They were enraged. They couldn't comprehend this, and they, he, the crowd was exasperated. And they voiced their disapproval with a great tumult that went throughout the chamber at what the Grand Master had said. Now, Gozen, he couldn't deny his disobedience. So when Velenueva ordered him to remove his mantle, he did so. And he folded it very carefully. And he placed that mantle at the foot of the Grand Master. And then he turned and walked away. And his disbelieving partisans, they opened up a way as he retreated, stunned. Now, Villanueva closely watched Chastise Knight as he departed. Now, he could only guess what was going on in that young knight's heart and soul. But now he certainly seemed to be accepting his fate with humility. Gozen had said nothing in his own defense, even when he had the crowd so strongly on his side. He didn't become angry or defiant, despite being publicly accused in front of all these people who were in favor of him and what he did. He continued to walk away slowly and silently. And as Villeneuve watched, there was no evidence of injured pride. And he thought, good signs, good signs to be sure. Now, the Grand Master's behavior to us might have seemed very harsh. It certainly did to the people. But he had not lived to this old age without learning wisdom. And he had seen the same pattern often repeated over and over again. He knew that frequently the first challenge for a knight was to conquer his own fears. This being done would enable that knight to conquer his foes. And finally, and the most difficult thing of all for the knight, if a knight was to be victorious, he must learn to conquer his pride, in essence, to conquer the master himself. And pride, pride was always the greatest danger. And then Grandmaster Villanueva called Gozen's name. And he told him, return. Gozen, return. And goes and stops. He turned slowly with his eyes downcast and retraced his steps back to the Grand Master. And he knelt again before the Grand Master, who unexpectedly extended his hand to him. Now, goes and looked up questioningly at Villanueva closely closely scrutinized Gozen's features. And the Grand Master smiled because he observed that there was no resentment, no sullen spirit, no heat of anger in the young knight's eyes. And Gozen reached out and he took the Nueva's hand and he kissed it. And in that moment, he became once more a knight of St. John. 
And a grandmaster then raised goes into his feet and embraces victorious feet. I just won his second victory of the day and a much greater one than the earlier victory in that day over the dragon. Through his humility, Gozen had driven a spike to the heart of the ancient dragon, the one we know, Saint. Now, the awe-inspiring head of the slain dragon was hung over one of the city's gates. And later in the 17th century, a famous and widely respected French scientist and traveler, Melchizedek Zemmonon, went to Rome to see the dragon's head for himself. Now, Zemmonon was a man that was very, very, very uh, pro, uh, to, pro, would not indulge in fantasy. That's what I'm trying to say. He was skeptical, and he was not an easily duped man. So he was very, very leery about indulging in legends and rumors and fantasies. And his observations should be treated with respect. even if we choose to disbelieve all the people of Rhodes and the Knights of St. John's themselves. And Seminole wrote that the dragon's head, when he visited this in the 17th century, was still hanging over the gate for any and all to see. And he described it as being larger than that of a horse with a huge mouth and teeth and very large eyes. That is his description. Again, a man that would not indulge in fantasies or was easily duped. Now, back to Gozen. He had proven himself now to his order and to his grand master. And his transgression was soon forgotten. But no one forgot the service he had done for the residents of this island. In the chivalrous night, he was beloved by all the simple people of Rhodes as long as he lived. And you know, he loved them unreservedly in return. And what's interesting, when Grand Master Helian de Villanueva died, it was Du Donne, de Gozon, who was elected to replace him, becoming the 26th Grand Master of the Order. Years later, upon the death of Grand Master Gozen in 1353, a simple marker gave final testimony of his remarkable deed, inscribed indelibly in the stone were the words that no man contested. Here lies the dragon slayer. So, incredible, fascinating story. And I'm sure people listening will be skeptics. No question about that. And skepticism is not a bad thing. We mentioned one of the characters in the story that did not, was a skeptic, but witnessed the head itself much, much later in history and wrote of it, what his description was of it. And the important parts here for us in this story, this hero of the Catholic faith, is, is, pa, is there was something terrorizing this town of Rhodes. And people knew it. They acknowledged it. And this, we can take credibility in. And many people tried to relieve this situation and never came back. Night after night, rode out. And this one, this 
night, conquered his fears, slayed the dragon, ended the terror, and then became the head of the hospital horse. But the spiritual truths here and what his grandmaster, Villanueva, and his wisdom knew is something that we can all take, all of us. Because he knew that the greatest dragon, the greatest fears in our lives that we know to overcome pale in comparison to overcoming that bedrock of sin which started all of this rolling way back in that battle of heaven between Satan and God and Satan's followers and St. Michael and his followers was pride. Because Satan would not serve and would not obey. And he wanted to be his own God, have his own kingdom. And when we look at Adam and Eve and the sin of the first parents, it's the same thing. Tempted by the ancient dragon, Satan, to disobey, who want to be God and to have their own kingdom. And we look at our age today, and many people, if you read the statistics, and we've got to be careful here, brothers and sisters, because we're living in a great age where there is a lot of fear-mongering. And when we have unbridled fear and we give into it, good things are not going to happen. And much of this is media-driven. We don't know how much is politically driven, agenda-driven, but it's out there. Now, as followers of Christ, we can take heart and not lose heart because of the promises Jesus has made to those who follow him. And if one is not a follower of Christ, it, it wouldn't hurt to possibly pick up a Bible and look at the promises that Jesus has made to those who follow him, especially if you are overcome with fear. Because fear can, it can paralyze you. And if you're watching the news and paying attention, there's many things to be afraid of. We live in a tumultuous time. And evil is rampant. Evil is rampant. And it seems as if good has become evil and the evil has become the good. And that is all due because of what happened in heaven, in the Garden of Eden, and with the story we just completed on part two. Because pride is the dragon most of us are going to have to face if we're going to become holy, if we're going to make a difference in bringing about the kingdom of God into a time that so desperately needs him, and yet, our system, this vaccine, and capitalism, bring socialism in. Let's try that system. Let's put this politician in. Let's put that politician in. Let's put this leader here and that leader there. Let's let this Supreme Court decide on what we'll do here and make legal and what we'll obey and what we won't. And in every situation, it's man. Man, who now is pointing toward himself as a savior. And still wants to keep God out of the public square. 
and it's fine, well, and good in some states to go grocery shopping, to have protests, to go to casinos, but you're not going to have people come to Mass or worship at a Protestant service. Oh, no. No, no, no. We're not going to allow that. That's a danger. And we see this being played out, an attack on religious liberty right in front of our eyes. And it's been going on for a long time. And some people will not acknowledge, what liberty? You still can worship. Well, you know, when they threw prayer out of school and they decided to remove symbols that were religious, and then we can replace a Christian-centered education system and Christian symbols and a prayer, throw it out, replace it with an atheistic belief, and look what we have. So when we throw God out of the picture in our free will, which we, God gives us, he will let us do it our way. And something to, to really ponder, take the prayer if, if you are a believer and, and, and pray in the silence, in moments of your prayer. And if not, just, you know, take a moment to reflect. Is, is our society throwing God out of the picture, being prideful that we are the answer, that we are our own savior, that we will establish a utopia here on earth? Is it really working? Is this the society, the way it's shaping up, the way it has been for the last few decades, is this the one we want to really live in? Is this what we want for our children and a generation after theirs? Do we really want to not be obedient, to not serve, and to become God? Because it seems to me that things aren't working because of this pride. And remember in our story, the great dragon, the one that the Grand Master was concerned about, was in the personal pride of Bozen. Now, he could have done a lot of things when he was dressed down. Think about it. Let's... let's Let's say you just closed a deal for your company. Your company employed 200 people. And if this deal didn't go through, you're finished. 200 people out of work, some with 25, 30 or more years of service to be let go, to start. Maybe they're middle-aged, maybe they're a little older. Where do they go? And three or four or five people went, and it wasn't enough to close the deal. They didn't like what they had to say, and each was turned away. But you, you did it. You did it. You saved the company. You saved those people with 25, 30 years. The company now, because of the deal that you closed, with your heroic effort, your hard work, saved over 200 people, including that company itself and those CEOs. And they welcomed you back and gave you testimonials and dinner. And then the head CEO in front of all his testimony with 200 people, their family, their friends, honoring you because you saved their jobs, you're dressed now. Because one time you didn't do that. And you goofed. And you disobeyed the CEO, and you cost some, the company some money, and you didn't pay attention to what he wanted to do that day, the day you cost him that money because of your disobedience. And he dressed you down for that because he couldn't allow it. What would you have done in the year 2020, especially in the COVID? Would you have defended yourself? Would you allow that murmuring crowd of the 200 and plus people there 
supporting you, a hero. You're a hero in their eyes. And they're murmuring, now, what is he talking about? See, oh, just saved everybody's bacon here. And would you have struck back in anger? Or would you like Gozen if the CEO asked you, I can't have you part of this company even though you did this? Because if you disobeyed once, you'll do it again. So please, please take your lead. And he was gauging you to see what was happening. What would you have done? Would you have walked quietly away? Eyes downcast like Gozen? As the CEO was shaping you up? Or were you struck out and fought back in pride? And see, there's a lesson there for us all. Because many times we do strike back because of that pride. How dare they do or say this to us, especially in the society we're living where there doesn't seem to be a lot of accountability for anyone, much or less people in power. And that's the dragon we all must slay. Certainly, if you are a believer in Christ, most definitely, but even even if you want to be a productive member and you do not believe in anything except what you can see, but to be a productive num- a member of society, that pride still has to have that stake driven through its heart. Because if we don't, we're going to get what we see we're getting. There's a lot of pride here right now. I've mentioned this before on other shows that some uh, students of history feel that this may be the most narcissistic age that mankind has ever seen. (laughs) And that is certainly, I chuckle, but that is certainly nothing to be uh, proud of. Because it's leading us into... A tremendous, tremendous difficulty because the basic rule for good human existence in harmony is to love God, to put him first, and then to love our neighbor as ourself. So, you know, these are the challenges we face today, and they can be overcome. Take heart. They can be overcome. We can do this. We can do this. So, with faith in God and our trust in God and making a sincere effort to have true sorrow and contrition for our sin and squelch down that pride, with God, all things are possible, even if they seem impossible. And with that, I would like to continue with another Catholic hero. And this is going to be a recent one in our time. And his name is Sergeant Michael Moynihan. And Sergeant Michael Moynihan is a 22-year-old Catholic and an American soldier. And he was recently awarded the Silver Star for his action in combat against the Taliban fighters in Afghanistan. Now, the Silver Star... That is a pretty, pretty important award for a soldier, a warrior. It's third highest combat for valor. Now, at this time, Michael was an infantryman assigned to Bravo Company, 2nd Battalion, the 27th Infantry, 
what was known as the wool pounds. He was a corporal then. And the wool pounds are normally stationed in Hawaii. But he was sent with his unit for a tour of duty in Afghanistan in October 2011. And he was on guard on the northern flank of Observation Post Shaw. And his job was to secure a road which was being paved near the border with Pakistan. And in this area, it was very remote and very hostile. And the duty that they were assigned, quite hazardous. And as a matter of fact, at that time, Corporal Moynihan telephoned his father to tell him that, you know, the odds of being su successful in coming back from this mission alive were slim to none. Imagine getting that call from your son. Imagine having to make that call to your father. Now, the incredible courage that was displayed by Michael over the next two days of intense combat were detailed in this narrative because it accompanied his award, his award, excuse me. Now, the firefight began on October 11th. And the American forces, they had come under sustained fire from the Taliban. And both sides experienced casualties. Men were dying on both sides. And as Sergeant Moynihan returned the fire, bullets were slamming into the ground all around. And mortars and rockets exploded all around him and throughout the camp. And as American soldiers looked about, they detected no less than 12 enemy positions. And two missiles were fired at them. As Moynihan manned an abandoned and completely exposed machine gun position. And from there, he was able to suppress the enemy fire. And he remained there as the Taliban forces worked desperately to zero in on his position to kill him. And the battle continued the following day. And Michael identified a Taliban fighter across the valley, and he shot and killed him with one shot from his rifle. And yet the Taliban continued to shoot and fire their rockets from their concealed position. And Michael realized that someone needed to try to mark those positions to direct return fire more efficiently. And he knew that this was going to be a dangerous, dangerous task. And as the statement said in his, reward, in his award, Michael took it upon himself to do with total disregard for his own safety, even as the dust settled from mortar impact. And proving that his strategy was effective, Michael then directed two missile strikes that killed seven Taliban fighters and a Taliban commander. And it still the battle raged on. And the Americans fought with rifles, grenades, claymores, everything to defend their position. And that evening, in an act of desperation, the enemy attacked with rocket-propelled grenades and AK-47 as they attempted to overrun the American position. And Sergeant Moynihan crossed an open area where he was fully exposed to an enemy gunfire. And he rallied his men. And he led a counterattack against the enemy assault. And he engaged the enemy with an M4 carbine. And he threw frag grenades. And he detonated claymores. And he took control of an abandoned Afghan machine gun position that saved valuable resources from being depleted while driving back the assault. And yet, the heaviest 
attack occurred on October 13th, and Michaels once again seemed to risk his life to direct enemy fire to acquire enemy fire in position. And a mortar exploded only 30 feet from Michael, and it knocked several of the American soldiers around him off their feet. And in seconds later, a second mortar around it landed. And this was close enough that the concussion knocked Michael unconscious and wounded five other American soldiers as well as three Afghanis. Now, as soon as Michael regained consciousness, he directed another soldier's fire while taking control of an Afghan machine gun. And he remained at that position until reinforcements arrived and the battle was finally brought to a close. And his award stated that Corporal Moynihan's courage under fire as a leader in Bravo Company saved the lives of American and Afghan soldiers. He held a vital position under extreme circumstances and was instrumental in helping destroy a determined enemy force. He risked his life in repelling two near ambushes that threatened to breach the vulnerable perimeter of his platoon's patrol base. Now, when he returned home, Michael's mom said of him, I'm very proud of my son, Michael. The qualities that he exercises in carrying out his duties to the United States Army comes from the solid foundation in which his father and I have endeavored to give him and his siblings in their upbringing through the Catholic faith. She said, St. Michael, pray for us. So, again, with our faith in God, filled with the Holy Spirit, our trust in God, you and me can overcome things that seem impossible because we have Christ on our side. And as St. Paul has said in Scripture, what have we to fear if Christ is on our side? Certainly, there are crosses and disappointments in life There is death that separates our loved ones from each other. And there are many crosses and many challenges we have to overcome. And we see it today. We see, as I mentioned earlier in the show, the rampant fear, the incredible increase in suicides, in addiction, in domestic abuse and it seems and we're hearing this that many people are sliding into a serious state now I'm not talking about one or two days of being down and then bouncing back but a sustained period of time of serious depression which is a very very serious thing and it seems people are losing hope And we cannot lose hope. We cannot lose hope. As a Christian follower of Jesus, hope is a strong weapon for us. Because we know in Christ he's won this victory. Even though we look and see the same right now, it should be unmistakable to us. And we can see Satan's rage. It's spreading. There is division, hatred, bitterness, violence, anarchy, disruption everywhere. There's, again, no dialogue. We talk against people. We gossip against people. There's constant criticism. And everywhere, hatred and anger, anger reigning. But we can look and see. And to quote 
Reverend Martin Luther King, to quote Dr. King, what he said was that hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And that's right. King has it right. Only love, only God can drive out Satan and his hatred. And that's hard to do in our society today because Jesus asked something very, very difficult of us. Love your enemies. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. You mean we've got to love Democrats and Republicans? We've got to love Joe Biden and President Trump? Mike Pence and Nancy Pelosi? Love blacks, love whites? Though, love those in Antifa and the police? Love terrorists? Love criminals? Tough act to do. But where there is love, there Christ is himself. And that is the vaccine we need. We need to have the love of Christ, not the division of Satan. You know, you may have seen it in your own families, your own friendship. Maybe family members are no longer talking to you or you've lost friendships because of this divide, especially in the political field. And we've said it before, religion and politics are two of the most important things we need to discuss, discuss, And have a dialogue. And that begins with the love of Christ, what he asks of us, to love God and then love our neighbor. That's how we start to turn back this raging tide of Satan. Because we're not going to do it with systems. And we're not going to do it with a sleight of hand. And we're not going to do it by triumphing over one side or the other with hatred and by ignoring one side or the other. But by love and by a common ground and by dialogue. You know, with everything going on and and still... There are many that believe in Christ. And that's a good spot for us to start. That's a good spot for us to start. A good foundation. Because if we agree that Jesus is God, and we believe in his teachings, then we can do many, many impossible things as a follower of Christ. Because we will have his grace. And with his grace, with that grace and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, there are many, many things that we can overcome, especially pride. Because pride can be overcome with humility. Don't we all admire somebody, for instance, that has accomplished, whether it's an athletic field or in the business world or uh, some kind of cure or something or an illness, and the people are humble? Don't we really like that? Isn't it better when we see somebody that says, you know, it was no big deal. This is this is what I wanted to do. This is what I set out to do. And, you know, I had a team, teammates that did this and other researchers. And you don't give all the credit to me because, you know, this was certainly a team effort. And, you know, I thank God for the abilities he gave me to do this. And isn't it better than someone, 
aren't we drawn to that more than someone who just goes up there and goes, man, I knew once I started out I was going to do this road. Nothing was going to stop me. You know, I had to overcome this. I had over I, 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 I. It can actually turn us away. And these lessons in these stories, the humility of the night goes and the wisdom of the Grand Master of Sergeant Moynihan's willingness to lay down his life for his friend are things that we can, we can aspire to, that we can try to reach in our lives. Because that hope that we possess is what Jesus told his apostles. Have confidence. For in this world, you will have many trials. But have confidence, for I have overcome the world. That is correct. By Jesus' resurrection, maybe you don't quite meditate on that resurrection or think enough or explore that resurrection or hear it from the pulpit, but that really is something, even though we don't know all the answers and how it could happen. But it's really something to ponder on. That if it wasn't for Jesus' resurrection, what he did for us, you and I at the end of our lives, no matter what we did, no matter what we accomplished, no matter what joys we had, no matter what we did for anyone, we would be annihilated. And that's, that's a scary thing. I would say that's a scary thing for most of us. And yet Jesus' resurrection takes that annihilation right out of the equation that there will be life everlasting and that there will be justice in the end and it will be his justice and that he has gone to his father to prepare a place for you and me and a place that's unique for you and me. And he said he would not have said this if it were not true. And as long as we're breathing and as long as we can take that nest breath, there's always hope, always, that we can turn our lives around and the society in which we live for the better, toward Christ, to be Christ-centered. We can do that. For as the angel Gabriel told Mary, at the Annunciation. And she was asked if she would be willing to have the Son of God that would save the people. And she gave her yes. Even though she questioned, how could this be? How could this be? Because in a natural way, I do not know man. And the angel Gabriel said, God, nothing is impossible. So as we close out the show tonight, let us take the archangel Gabriel's word deep in our heart and deep in our soul to truly believe and pray. Pray for the belief and faith to truly believe the truth that with God, nothing is impossible. Night and what? Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. 
Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you are never alone. God is always with you. To a production of WCAT Radio, please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.